Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hopefully, ah, oh, great. Okay, we've got the slide deck up and running. That's very good. So, uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, Kevin and, and the PPH team for inviting us to participate in this meeting today. And actually, thrilled by to see the number of people here to to listen to what's going on in the neurology field. So um, I think before I kick off this presentation, because I'm not going to be talking about NFL in any, any level of detail, because it's quite a humbling experience to be on the same stage as some of the world leaders in this space. So I'm really going to be talking about industry and process, which is really what we believe to be the gap between where a lot of the research is being done into the real world of clinical applications of the NFL assay. So. Anybody here in the audience actually runs a routine laboratory? Just a handful, okay? Any of you are from the IVD industry? I think we said some Abbott folks, so a couple of folks here too. Okay, okay, that, that's, that's good to know because I think probably what I'm gonna do for the majority of you, this is gonna be relatively new in terms of the background that goes on to bring these new tests and you've You've heard some fantastic information so far on the clinical applications to bring this into the clinical market. So before I kick off, just a little bit of background of myself. I'm Andrew Beard. I'm the head of business development and uh, partnering for what we call the Siemens Healthcare Lab in Berkeley, California. And uh, I've had kind of uh, a career, shall we say, in the IVD industry in almost every role you can think of. So um, actually being able to present this, uh, to do this presentation actually brings back a lot of the things that I've done in the past in the IVD uh, world. <coughs> so really uh, what I want to try and do today is to give you a little bit of background as to who we are, Siemens Health and Ears. You've heard we're Siemens, you probably understand Siemens being a big industrial company and everything else. We're going to talk a bit about our, our interest in NFL, nothing about the clinical side, but really how the decisions were made in terms of our interest in the NFL space. And then really what we're here to do is to talk about how do we go from a research assay into a mainstream clinical assay, all right, in terms of what it's going to be doing and how it's going to be deployed and all the various elements that you need in place to have a successful business or a successful biomarker. So this is a little bit of background of Seamus Health and Ears. We're one of the major diagnostic companies, uh, much in the same as you, you'll have people here from Abbott, I'm sure, and Roche and others, where we all compete, at, shall we say, in the, uh, in, in the blood testing side. That's some of the business. But I think the key here from the point of view of us as an industrial company in the diagnostic space is that we have global operations. And we're really talking about here about being able to globalize a test available for people not only down the road, for example, or it could be in London, it could be, in, it could be over in Boston, it could be anywhere in the world. You have a standardized test that people can use where you have unique, uh, where you have unique cutoffs that enable you to uh, utilize that test wherever you are. So this is a little bit of background as to who we are uh, as a company in terms of product portfolio that we offer. Many of you actually probably know uh, uh, of our existence, mostly actually through what we do on the imaging side of the business. But we also have a mainstream blood testing side of the business as well. And the beauty about neurology is actually it combines both neurobiomarkers and blood-based biomarkers. And we think this is a very strong position to have, especially having NFL in the portfolio of what, we're, what we could be offering in the future, because there's clearly a combination of putting these two modalities together. What we do, if you look at the bottom uh, right-hand side, is a Siemens healthcare lab. We're basically offer end-to-end -end diagnostic solutions for the biopharma industry. And as you'll probably understand, they're a key player in this particular space. And we work very closely with our internal partners uh, called Lab Diagnostics, who have the mainstream business for clinical chemistry and immunoassay platforms. So this just gives you a bit of a picture as to what routine immunoassay platforms look like, okay? Um, <coughs> as they say, they, you've got two uh, mainstream immunoassay platforms. One's the Advia Centaur platform on the left-hand side. That's been out for many years, and it uses the Acrodema ester-based technology from the point of view of detection of, uh, of the endpoint of these immunoassays. This platform's been out for many years already. It has a very high throughput, 240 tests per hour. You kind of need that. In the mainstream labs of today, though, you'll have multiples of these systems running 
the, uh, running the, the volume of immunoassays that these uh, labs need to run these days. The, the new kid on the block is our Atelica, um, Atelica immunoassay and chemistry solutions. This was launched two years ago and really reflects how the lab, the lab environment is changing. It's all around consolidation. It's really about turning those routine labs, and I recommend you go out and talk to your, your, your lab directors or have a look. It's very much about making these labs routine and they're turning out, they're basically turning into factories. So really what you're trying to do is to automate as much as possible, standardize the process of running the immunoassays, or in fact, in this particular case, you've got a combination of chemistry and immunoassay all consolidated more or less into a modular platform. This is really, the, this is how we see the next generation of platforms. And these are the platforms we're using for the NFL assay. So this just gives you a bit of a flavor as to what menu consolidation means. And this is just one of the one levels of consolidation you need to enter into a lab where you will have a whole gamut of different types of assays for various disease states all clinically validated. And then, of course, what we're doing is adding on an incremental new test called NFL. If NFL was a standalone test with its own instrument, it would be very difficult to penetrate this particular market because nobody wants to invest in a single piece of equipment just for one single test. This is where menu consolidation is important. And then you get instrument consolidation, and then you get supplier consolidation on top of that. That's the reality of the world we live in for, uh, for biomark, uh, for, um, uh, for the IVD diagnostics. So what's our interest in NFL? Well, it started actually in about 2017 when we started working alongside, uh, alongside Biogen. I think Tatiana was actually reached out to us uh, initially. Oh, there's Tatiana over there. Um, and uh, actually convinced us that NFL was the best biomarker in 20 years in the MS space. That was actually good enough for us at the time. But at the time, we didn't know we could achieve the relative sensitivities that we needed to achieve to make this thing operational on, uh, on one of our routine platforms. Well, the proof of the pudding's in the poster, as they say, and this last Actrims, we published the, the performance of our version one assay. And it met all the requirements we wanted to have to achieve the sensitivity and to work with routine samples that we wanted. And then, of course, uh, more recently, um, you will have seen that uh, we have uh, we've partnered with Uman and Quanterix with regard to the access to the Uman antibodies. And there's a very good reason for that. I'll show you later. So this is the journey, if you like, of patient access to a clinical NFL assay. You have the RUO market, and then you have, obviously, the starting point of making a test clinically available wherever you are in the world is you've got to have a kit developed, and you've got to have an install base. We have the install base, those instruments I showed you earlier. There are several thousand of those out around the world. We operate in those 75 countries directly. And now we need to think about developing the kit. So the two pieces are in place, at least for having a kit available. But that's not the end of the story. And this is where I think that Kevin mentioned it earlier, how we want to, this is going to be an effort of a village to really make this happen, is this. Even though you may have the world's best test available, it needs to be available to the labs, okay? It needs to be requested by the physicians, and it needs to be reimbursed. If, if, there's, if there's any breakdown in that bridge, you will not get this test being adopted for full-scale clinical, uh, clinical utility. So I put this slide up as just uh, an illustration of the world you live in in the IVD world, because this really does condition a lot of the internal process for developing what we do. And it's because we're going from like a research environment into a highly regulated, stringent environment where kits are developed for clinical applications. And this just gives you a flavor of all the different uh, regulatory authorities in the world today. And when we develop a test, we don't think about it for the US. We don't think about it for Europe. It has to meet all those requirements across the board. The good news is there's some harmonization between all the different regions, but it's not perfect by a long way. So what does that do? So these stringent regulatory requirements directly impact what we do internally from the point of view of the, uh, of, of the it drives our quality and business practices. So on the one hand, you, it, it, it influences 
and it has a major impact on our QMS systems, our quality management systems, but what does that mean? Okay, so what? It means that it overrides or it gives us influences what we do in the development processes for the applications, the kits themselves, how we develop them, the equipment we build as well. Don't think that just because you've got a kit that it's necessarily the equipment's going to meet those regulatory requirements. It all has to go through essentially the same process and meet the same kinds of regulatory needs. It has major impacts on our operational processes, manufacturing, supply chain, really importantly, customer support. So when you have a problem, when your lab has a problem, they can pick up the phone, give us a call, and there'll be someone there to pick up the call and sort out the problem, because this test is being used clinically. And then finally, business process as well, impacts documentation and our sales and marketing process as well. So it's all the above. Basically, the entire organization is very much driven by the regulatory requirements. So what do we actually do to develop an assay? It all starts with definitions. And the end point is, if you like, is what we call our instructions for use, which is the little package you get in your kit that tells you exactly what does that kit do. It's a very, very important part of the uh, setting up of the, uh, the development process. So what does it entail? Well, number one, well, you heard today many different applications of NFL. Fantastic, absolutely brilliant. And they're very impressive, some of the data that you're seeing. But in the world of the IVD diagnostics, you have to choose one. You can't do them all. You have to choose one. You may want to extend beyond that uh, over time. But in order to get your test regulatory approved, you've got to choose one application. Outside that, the, uh, the definitions are, so you can kind of see some of the, um, the possibilities. You've got diagnosis, you've got prediction of future events, whatever they are. You've got monitoring disease progression or monitoring therapy effectiveness. All those could be an intended use of your test. But that has a major implication then for the regulatory channels you go through as well. So, for example, if you go for a diagnostic claim, it's probably the most stringent kinds of regulatory submissions you need because you're, making, you're diagnosing someone on the basis of a single result. If it's a prognostic claim, probably the, 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 the barriers, the, the, the hurdles are slightly lower. So it just gives you a sense of what that's like. Operational specs as well also have to be accounted for when you're designing these assays. In other words, what are your system constraints? What are your customer requirements? For example, a customer requirement could be um, you calibrate this assay once every 56 days. All right, so you do one calibration, it's valid for 56 days. That's a, that's, a, that's a very good specification that we have to design the stability of the reagents for to make sure they work on our platforms. And then you've got manufacturing specs as well. They all get bound in together into what we call the, um, into a, uh, the definition. So what are we going to do for NFL? Well, we clearly see that MS is going to be the first disease to, in which this is going to be offered. And then exactly there's an internal debate right now as to the exact intended use. So how does the definition feed into the rest of the development? This is a classical sort of product development cycle. You will see this. This is very common in most IVD companies where you go through the definition, you go to the feasibility, development verification, validation, release, and then, of course, you do your regulatory approvals. I would say this, and this is the misconception often about what you do in development. You think development, you end up playing around with the reagents for, what, 90% of the time, and then it goes into manufacturing, and then it gets delivered as a product. Well, that's completely the reverse. You probably spend about 20% of your time optimizing the reagents, and the rest of it is really down to the validation you have to do to put it into manufacturing. There's a huge difference between going from something that's benchtop level, which you're probably familiar with in the research area, into something where it's essentially like a, you know, you're going to be manufacturing millions of these tests at once. And you need to know the first kit is exactly the same as the last kit that you manufacture in a run. That is incredibly challenging. So therefore, a lot of time and effort's made to make sure that the, uh, the kits are reproducible. This can also take several years. But what we've done to shortcut this is actually through the through the agreement we have with, with Quanterix, it gives us the fundamental antibodies that we need for this assay. And I think somebody mentioned it earlier. They are unique, the Uman antibodies for NFL. They've been extremely good to us. Um, secondly, uh, we also have a prototype assay, that this is, uh, which is a lab-developed test that we run in our Berkeley lab. That is also essentially a final formulation of the assay. So that's probably also going to feed into this uh, whole process. So that, again, 
we aren't going to cut any corners. We're still going to do the, do the development side, but each of these phases, at least in the early part, is going to be very much condensed. And as we go into validation, depending on the claim we want to make, it's going to, we're going to probably have to access particular patient, uh, patient cohorts to make those specific claims. If in the event that you're going for antibodies from the get-go, or you're seeking a monoclonal antibodies, this process can take five to six years. But fortunately, because of the shortcuts that we have, we should be, uh, we're, we're targeting to be able to reduce that down significantly from where it is, maybe around 50% of the time. So just two other, a uh, couple of final slides before I finish. Uh, one is, I have mentioned earlier that even though you've got the best assay, it's got to be adopted by the various uh, stakeholders in the, uh, in the marketplace. So here you, have the, you need to have a quite an aggressive clinical strategy once your test is available. So you're talking about awareness, guidelines, ongoing clinical validity in particular patient groups have to be ongoing. And I'll just put on the right-hand side, certainly in the MS space, there are a number of interested parties ranging from, uh, obviously, professional groups, patient groups, and uh, pharmaceuticals. The other piece is reimbursement. If you thought developing assays was difficult, try reimbursement. Every country has its own healthcare system. All right? No one recognizes how healthcare is funded by another country. So at every country level, you need to have quite a, you need to have a visible reimbursement plan. I won't go into all the details there, but uh, perhaps the most complex, I'll probably say, is the US system. That's the one we focus on. In, in Berkeley, but outside the fact you'll have several years of development of the assay, you can have several years of gaining reimbursement as well. So it's not a slam dunk just because you have the test available that this translates into a test that can be, can be sold. You've got to realize the labs of today are, pretty, uh, are obviously very savvy about running new tests, and it's highly unlikely they're going to run a new test if they're not going to get paid for it. That's just the reality of running a lab these days. So, in conclusion, I think we know what we're doing about developing new tests, developing manufacturing, and distributing high-performance NFL tests or IVD tests. But to steal actually some of Kevin's uh, comments to start with, it will certainly take a village for successful adoption of this test worldwide. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.